Hey everyone, Philip here, and this is Brainstorm. Rates of depression have been rising globally. We see this especially in teenagers, and even more so in girls compared with boys. Today we'll try to figure out why that is, and what causes depression to begin with. Before we dive into today's rabbit hole, and it is a rabbit hole, I wanted to ask you, our community here, if you have any experience with depression. You can give your answer anonymously up here, or if you're on your phone, in the description below and you can see how many other people share your experiences. I have to be honest here for a second. I found the idea of creating a video on depression daunting. Depression is perhaps the worst mental disorder one can experience. It destroys perspectives, undermines relationships, and steals all of your joy. Depression isn't a disease you're grateful for having. It doesn't open doors, it closes them. Thankfully, I received a lot of help and support from an amazing community on Reddit, the subreddit depression underscore help. Go check it out. Let's get one thing straight right away. Depression is not the same thing as being sad. You can't just pull yourself together and snap out of it. Many people experience depression, and it is important to realize, even though they all share a common theme, how different their experiences are. It is a deeply personal affliction. Depression is a highly biological disorder. We can see this in its symptoms. Number one, sleep. People with depression usually wake up around 4 to 5 a.m. Sleep is normally divided into so-called sleep cycles of about 90 minutes. These are clearly interrupted in people with depression. Two, loss of appetite. People with depression don't just munch on chocolate all day. Quite the opposite. They eat less. Classic symptom. Three, motor retardation a loss of function or a decrease in muscle tone and motor function. It can get even worse into a mental fogginess or slowness of thoughts or even slurriness of words. All of this points to the clear biological nature of depression. It's not just a question of getting over it. You wouldn't tell your friend with diabetes, let's call him Robin, to get over insulin. Robin, get over insulin. So what do we know about the causes of depression? Are you ready for some neurobiology? No? Don't worry, I'll try to keep it as simple as possible, but this part is really important if you want to understand depression, so stick with me. Back in the 1950s, people were treated for hypertension with a drug called Rezapine. Rezapine did help with high blood pressure, but in about 15% of those patients, it also induced depression-like symptoms. How can that be? And what does Rezapine do in the brain? Let's have a look. These vesicles are necessary for it to be released into the synapse between the neurons where it can do its job and dock at the receptor of the next neuron. Resipine blocks the packaging of certain neurotransmitters called monoamines, specifically noadrenaline. A few years later, researchers found that a different type of antidepressant, tricyclic antidepressants, worked by blocking the reuptake of those neurotransmitters into the cell. Basically, they blocked noadrenaline from being recycled into the neuron for reuse. Therefore, it's stuck around the synapse longer and can bump more often into the postsynaptic receptors, which is its job, which leads to more activation. So scientists have discovered two things. If you give people a drug that decreases certain neurotransmitters like noadrenaline or serotonin, people get depressed. And if you give depressed people drugs that increase those neurotransmitters in the brain, they get better. What would you be thinking right now if you were those scientists? Exactly, depression is a lack of those neurotransmitters, specifically noadrenaline and serotonin. Since then, many new antidepressant drugs have been developed with fewer side effects and better targeting. For instance, SSRIs, you hear that word all the time. It stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors, which is a fancy word for saying those drugs block the pumps that put serotonin back into the neuron to be recycled. We have even found a gene that is linked to those serotonin pumps that helps predict if someone gets depression as an adult. Interestingly, your chance of getting depression with having this version of the gene are the highest if you had experienced several negative life events. Okay, so depression is a chemical imbalance in the brain due to a lack of certain neurotransmitters like noadrenaline or serotonin. It doesn't explain the rise in depression in teenagers in the last few years, but so what? If we give people medication that increases their neurotransmitters, they get better. We fixed it, guys. Depression is solved. Case closed. What? 
Yeah, depression is more complicated than that. What about grief though? What if, for instance, you lost a loved one, like a partner or a child, and you're grieving? Is that depression? And how do clinicians and psychiatrists even define depression to begin with? Enter the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistic Manual, aka the Bible of psychiatrists, at least in the US. A few decades ago, if you lost a loved one and you were grief-stricken and in pain of the loss, you fulfilled most or all of the questionnaire requirements of the DSM, meaning you were diagnosed with depression. Clinicians noticed this and they added an exception to the DSM. If you fulfilled all the requirements for depression, but you lost a loved one in the last year, you were not depressed, you were grieving. And over the years, this grieving period was reduced from one year to six months, and then one month, and then two weeks. And then the latest of the DSM, the DSM-5, it was reduced to nothing. No more exceptions, only depression. Let's think about this for a second. You just lost a child and you're in unimaginable pain and grieving. You could go to a psychiatrist and they could classify you with a mental disorder because you're in pain over the death of your child. All of this because your healthy and normal reaction to the loss of a child is indistinguishable from the symptoms of depression in the DSM, which we just learned is caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain. How does that make sense? If depression is truly caused by an imbalance of neurotransmitters in your brain, how can something that happened to you in your life lead to depressive symptoms? Something's going on here and we should dig deeper. Can we look at other events in people's lives and see if they have any association or connection with depression? What about the one thing we spend most of our waking hours on? Work. Since the 1960s, there's been an amazing ongoing research study into the health and well-being of British civil servants, the famous Whitehall studies. They published hundreds of papers and written books on social stress, hierarchy, and even suicide. For instance, they found that low-ranking employees in the hierarchy were four times as likely to die of a heart attack compared with top brass at the top of the hierarchy. Today, we'll focus on the findings on depression. They found there were two main predictors of people's depression and even suicide. Number one, a lack of control. And number two, a disbalance between your effort and your rewards. Lack of control is pretty straightforward. It basically is a measure of your autonomy at work. How much freedom do you have to decide what you work on, when do you work? Number two, a disbalance or an unfairness between your effort and the rewards. What does that mean? Imagine it doesn't matter how hard or effective you work. You will never be recognized or rewarded for it. At the same time, if you slack off and just do the bare minimum not to get fired, same thing. Nobody notices, nobody recognizes it, no criticism, no impact. You're not being recognized or even treated as a normal human being. That's horrible. So it seems like that besides an imbalance of neurotransmitters and you grieving if you've lost a loved one, your job, your work has a huge influence on depression. Let's look at the newest and best data by Gallup on this question. 85% of employees around the world are either not engaged or actively disengaged from their jobs. 85%, only 15% are engaged. If that doesn't worry you, it should. But what if you're unemployed and you don't have a job at all? We see here that after a little dip during three to five weeks of unemployment, the rates of people getting treated for depression goes from around 10% all the way up to 19% after a year of unemployment. Every year in the Western world in the US, hundreds of thousands of millions of jobs are being automated away. Cashier jobs, retailer jobs, bank teller jobs, all of them are being automated away. What's the most common profession in the US? Driver, transportation, Google and Tesla are spending billions of dollars and thousands of the smartest people they can throw at the problem of self-driving cars, autonomous cars. Within the next five to 10 years, most truck drivers will lose their jobs. And what happens next? If we can trust the data on this, things are not looking good. 100% increase of depression, increase in chronic pain, opioids, addiction. This is really worrisome. Back to the psychology of unemployment and depression. If you remember, one of the best predictors for depression was a lack of control. And if you think about it, being unemployed or out of work 
makes you even more powerless. You have less control over your life to exert some sort of influence on it. You're truly helpless and dependent on other people. One of the most important concepts in psychology is learned helplessness. How does it work? You put three different groups of puppies and dogs into a cage or a harness. Group one gets into the harness and then gets taken out again. Nothing happens. Group two gets into the harness and receives random small electric shocks throughout the experiments, but it can stop the shock by pressing a lever. Group three gets into the harness, gets electric shocks, but there's no lever for them to stop the electric shocks. A little later, the same dogs are put into a special box called a shuttle box, where they get electric shocks on one side of it, but they can escape the electric shocks by jumping over a small barrier. Dogs from group one and two learn that very quickly and always jump to the other side to not get shocked. But dogs from group three who got shocked and couldn't stop it with a lever did nothing. They stayed lying and whimpering on the left side of that shuttle box, receiving the electric shocks. They learned earlier that they live in a world where they cannot influence shocks, they're helpless. So they're not even trying to escape the shock in a shuttle box. What does any of this have to do with depression? If you paid attention, you realize it has everything to do with depression. What's the single best predictor of depression in adulthood? Losing a parent as a child under the age of 10. Why is that? Developmental changes under the age of 10 are really important for later development. And you learn in those years how the world works. If one of your parents dies and is taken away from you, you learn that the world is scary and uncertain and you cannot stop suffering from happening to you and to people you love. You're learning the world is a scary and dangerous place. So we've seen that work matters a lot and learned helplessness as a concept is a really important idea to have in mind when thinking about depression. It also shows us that social connections with your parents matter a lot. Let's look at other meaningful connections in your life and how they can influence depression. Have you ever wondered why loneliness as an emotion even exists? Why it sometimes can feel as real as physical pain or injury? I don't want to go too deep into the evolutionary psychology of this, but we are social primates. You know, our emotions are wired up to help us to live in troops or tribes for our protection and safety. If you want to know more about this, please check out my embarrassing first YouTube video in the description below. Research by John Kachopa and others in Chicago has helped us understand the biology and psychology of loneliness. They found that reported loneliness or feelings of being lonely are connected to increases in stress hormone and detrimental health effects. It gets even worse. Older studies have found that people who report social isolation are two times more likely to die in the next 10 years. Think about this. This is crazy. Being socially isolated and lonely can increase your death rate by 200%. Nobody would have believed this data 50 years ago. No one. Almost all the scientists were sure that your social life has no effect on your biology or your health. But what about loneliness and its link to depression? Not only is loneliness highly correlated to depression, but we also found that loneliness is a cause of depression that can predict future depression above and beyond you just being depressed. The story gets worse. Not only does loneliness cause depression, but depression increases loneliness. So we have a positive feedback loop, and that's really bad. Johan Hari writes about this in his book. People who become a little depressed and are sliding down into major depression, and who need the social connection to friends and family the most, become a little difficult to be around and push people away, therefore leading to more isolation and more loneliness and more likely depression in the future. During the beginnings of a depression, when we would need family and friends the most and strong social connections the most, we tend to push people away and are being difficult to be around. But there's also good news, the flip side of this. If you have just one good close friend or family member or spouse that sticks with you, your chance of depression decreases by 50%. So clearly, social connections and feeling lonely matter. If you're curious about your own levels of loneliness or you just want to see how scientists measure loneliness to begin with, I created a short little survey you can find in the description below. You can fill it in and I'll send you your results personally. Okay, we're deep down the rabbit hole now, but I think we've almost all the puzzle pieces in place to try to answer why there's such a large increase in depression in teenagers in the last few years. Let's have a look at the figures again. We see pretty stable rates of depression for both boys and girls from 2004 till 2010. And starting in 2011 and 12, there's a sharp increase, especially in girls, a little less so in boys. 
Couldn't it just be that we're more aware of depression as a disorder and people are getting diagnosed more often? Could be, yes, but I personally wouldn't expect such a big difference between boys and girls. A final point against this increased awareness is a tragic one. We not only see increases in depression, but also in actual behaviors like self-harm and suicides. Again, especially for girls. So what causes this? Could it be a change in chemical imbalances and genetics for serotonin receptors? Probably not. If loneliness is such a big factor in depression, could it be that the new generation of teenagers is much more lonely? Let's have a look at the data for the S again. And yes, I'm sorry, I'm drowning you in charts and figures and data, but this is the last part and this is really important. Let's have a look. We see here declining rates of loneliness and it declines from the 1990s all the way to 2007, 2008 before it starts to rise rapidly at around 2009, 2010. This new generation of teenagers seems to be the loneliest generation in decades. What changed in the lives of those teenagers that I as a millennial didn't have? And specifically, what changed between 2007 and 2012? Can you think of a thing? I can. It's called iPhone, Facebook, Instagram. Facebook became really popular between 2007 and 2010. Instagram started in 2010. The iPhone was released in 2007, 2008 and became popular with teenagers around 2009 and 2010. As a scientist, I'm forced by science law to tell you that correlation isn't causation and we can't be sure that one caused the other, but they're at least correlated in time. And that's a good start and a first hint. For now, I would say this is a pretty good explanation and the best I could find. The data isn't quite clear in this and we can't be sure that social media causes loneliness or depression. Other surveys show that children feel less lonely because of social media. But it's the first theory and it's the best one I could find. Okay, this video is growing longer and longer and I'm way down this rabbit hole for weeks already. But what have we learned? Depression is highly biological and biology matters. But no organism can be understood without the environment it lives in. Negative life events in childhood specifically can increase your chance of depression. Positive, stabilizing factors like solid, strong relationships can decrease your chances of getting depression. We seem to have two dividing camps here. One is in the biology, antidepressants and neurotransmitter imbalances, and it's all biology. And other ones completely ignore that again and say, no, it's all social interaction and how you live your life and if you're happy at work and if you have a solid family. The truth is somewhere in the middle, both matter. Depression is multifactorial, which is fancy talk for many different things influence it and influence each other. Your genes matter, your social environment matters, your childhood matters, your neurochemistry matters, your stress hormones matter, your happiness at work matter. All those things work together. But let's say we have to predict the chance of depression for two different people. Let's start with genetics. We add the genetics for both of those people. One of those people has the good version of the serotonin receptor gene, the other one has the bad version for depression. This means one person already has a higher chance of depression, the other one has a lower chance of depression. We add to this life stressors and early lifehood adversities. For the person with the bad gene, this exponentially increases the chance now because it has the bad gene and those early life events. For the other person, no adverse life events and the good gene keeps the depression rate pretty low. If you then add social aspects, like how many friends someone have, if they live in a happy family or happy marriage, if they're happy at work, what their stress levels are, if they're healthy, if they're eating healthy, if they're sleeping well, we can increase and decrease those for those different people. All of those come together and we would probably be able to predict depression rates with fairly high certainty. We just don't have that information for everyone. One of the things I wanted to communicate implicitly with this video and I'm telling you explicitly is how difficult it is in biology or medicine to truly know what causes something, what causes a sickness or disorder. Humans are very complex and our life is an intermingling of genetics and environment and social interactions and hormones and stressors and then and, and that's just how it is. It's really hard to know what caused something. Thank you so much for watching. This has been a whirlwind tour through depression for me in the last few months. If you like those kinds of videos, I'll encourage you to subscribe down in the button below. And if you want to be notified when the next video on depression is released in a month or two, also don't forget to click the bell, then you know you'll be notified for sure by YouTube. If you're curious about the loneliness questionnaire, click on the description below. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate all your comments. Stay safe. Thank you so much for watching.